a question actually. I thought it was really interesting. You said that you didn't have any roofs in the city, presumably due to light pollution. I was just mm. interested in that because back a while ago when I did my PhD in WA, we actually found that bats tended to be quite common in the city because the lights attracted insects, which they then fed on. And so I was, but that was looking at them flying. So I'm wondering, do yeah. you think they're like actually using those areas and then roosting out of the city? Or do you think in Brisbane where it's a lot bigger city, maybe brighter, that they're not there at all? Yeah. Like what, what are your thoughts? Ob- obsessed with this concept, yes. Uh, because so much research is focused on bats while foraging. So you set up traps and catch them while they're flying around. Um, but that would be like only surveying people where they're on their morning commute to work. Um, if you're driving in from the inner city in a low socioeconomic area with high levels of pollutant and noise pollution and crime, you might be a little bit more stressed. Your health aspects might be a bit different than someone who's driving to the same area from you know really cushy, high, high income neighborhood. So looking at where these guys actually live, I think has been this massive gap in the research. Um, so what I have found is just the types of buildings in really inner city just aren't as conducive to bat roost. They sometimes can live in factory buildings, but I haven't been able to get in touch and form relationships with factory building owners who will let me climb their factory building to find their bats. So I am a bit biased in that survey result. There might be a few of those um, bat roost sites in inner city or more urbanized areas. But what I do suspect is the buildings themselves, there's less pool umbrellas, there's less old Queenslander homes with, you know, wood beams for the bats to live in. And so the bats that live there are either commuting in, which there's some research that they do, or they're subsisting in really small patches of botanical gardens and hollow trees. What they're not doing is um, interfacing very closely with humans. So it's just an interesting bias that we have with the structures that benefit bats, or at least that they use as anthropogenic roost are mostly in that peri-urban space. Once they get too rural, they go back to natural sites like trees. Once you get too urban, they don't seem to be able to find um, suitable type structures. Yeah, take, take a seat. <laughs> this is for you, Robin, and also for the, the girls in WA. Um, are you going to... I run a program called Australasian Bat Night. You know about that, Robin. And so I would like you to have an event next next March, April or May um, about your research um, for the Sunshine Coast. We did that. Yeah, we'll do yeah. it again. You've yeah. got to do it I'll every be there. year. I'll be there for sure. Every yeah, year. Yeah, we did that last year. Um, I got one roost from my Australasian Bat Night. Yeah. So out of all my outreach, that was pretty effective. Yeah. But, you know, give people come far, tell them what you've done this time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, looking involved. forward to many bat nights ahead. Yeah. yeah, and I'd love you guys in WA to do that too because we need more bat nights in WA. Yeah. Bat nights. Sorry, can I just add on um, with that? So another program I work on in Perth is called Rewild Perth, which is all about supporting people to create their wildlife-friendly gardens. And we've done a few workshops um, with a bat expert, Joe Tunga, um, where we've gone on night stalks to see the micro bats in South Perth. And um, yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. So we'd love to connect more on that. Thank you. As, as I make my way up the back. Oh, you've oh got I've a got microphone. one already in my back pocket here. <laughs> um, every now and then I have a, a huge period of lamenting as I see our old wooden bridges being destroyed because for many reasons, but one is because it, they're great microbat habitats. Oh, yeah. There's one near us right now that's just gone last week at Pomona, and there's this massive highway across our little six mile creek. It looks a bit ridiculous. But I just wonder um, what you know, Robin, about how we can influence more um, departments like transport, main roads and transport, when they're building these and building. Um, designs into um, structures to create more habitat for these little insectivorous bats but for all sorts of animals as well. Yeah, so the concept of infrastructure as a wildlife roost is obviously really complex. It is another aspect of my project looking at um, our large-footed myotis which live in bridges as well as culverts. Uh, It's a complex problem. If we don't have enough tree roosts and they're using the bridges, it might be because that's their best option and removing them or excluding them out of those sites might be removing really valuable roost space. But with that said, old wooden bridges do degrade and need to be repaired for um, health and safety reasons. Uh, And anytime you're building a site that you know has an end date and 
potentially could have large amounts of disruption. There's a, a lot of implications for conservation and uh, wildlife human health risk as well if you're creating these sites with large disruptions, um, large amounts of stressed out animals that can have some negative outcomes. At the moment, it's a really um, interesting space. I'm hoping that Australia progresses to catch up with the rest of the world with our guidelines. But the biggest guideline is just don't do renovations during maternity season, which is spring, summer. Uh, we're still working on convincing everyone to do that. Um, it is a, a written down guideline, but it doesn't always get followed. But that's the, the biggest thing that um, infrastructure um, organizations can do is just don't rip down bridges when there's a bunch of babies. Yes, this may be a rhetorical question perhaps, but what do we do when we have a city council that in one year funds a uh, microbat survey and finds about 15 species with the help of a local citizen science group and a couple of years later approves a light show in its own botanical gardens, in one of the few precious dark areas in the city uh, and you know, threaten perhaps uh, the uh, uh, survival of some of those bats. Um, so artificial light at night, um, good old Alan, um, is, it's a bit complex for the bats. Some bats actually seem to um, use artificial lights to attract insects. They use it as a hunting technique. So it's not across the board devastating for all of them, but it absolutely changes species diversity. Um, but at the end of the day, they're utilizing our cities. I've got bats living in, in human houses inside the house with artificial lights on 24-7 and they seem to be persisting. So I don't think we actually understand en enough about how that impacts their stress physiology to make huge implications. We certainly know it decreases diversity. So uh, at least for short term, um, the bats that can't handle Allen will leave um, and forage in other places potentially and hopefully come back. Um, so it's, yeah, as, as we keep trying to make humans happy and increase joy in the human space, we also need to hopefully not increase widespread devastation in the wildlife space. That's a complex problem. Oh, this one's for Kit. Um, I'm involved in a, a study in Canberra which is looking at how pollinators move through our public urban space and yeah, how different structure of that influences. We've got 50 people recording over 30 minutes um, within a specified area anything that lands on a flower. The difficulty we're having is that it really, the photographing insects is difficult and some people are really good at it and some people aren't so good at it and to trying to standardise that effort um, so you get meaningful data is, is proving difficult. So I was wondering if you had any advice on that. Yeah, so standardising data is a big challenge in citizen science and because everyone has different observation levels for example a child's eyesight is really great they will be able to see a tiny little wasp some of us our eyes aren't as good um and you know some bees are three millimeters long um so that is a challenge i guess what i find as well with and taking photos of insects it's rewarding when you get a great photo but there's plenty of terrible photos that I take. Um, videoing. If you video, then you can slow it down and take a screenshot. It's not perfect, but you still have something there. And then you've got like the data and yeah. Slow motion video, you can slow it down, pause it, take a screenshot. And you can do that for maybe, you know, two minutes every 10 minutes. Sorry? Yeah, just iPhone video. Um, and yeah, that way you can, rather than, you know, by the time you, if you're trying to take a photo, by the time you press the button, the insects flown off, if you video it and then you can, that's what I sometimes do as well. That's a so, great bit of advice. Yeah. Videographers find that's the best way to get me during a presentation. <laughs> I'm next. Um, <laughs> this is a question for the uh, native gardening people. Do you know if local city councils are actually supporting those types of efforts? Because I know in Wellington, New Zealand, they, people even get paid to plant the local reserves, like um, road reserves, which the council owns, but wants citizens to come along and maintain. They don't want to mow them, they want native plantings on it. So if it's right outside your door, you can actually get funding for plants to plant native plants on the road reserve. Yeah, I'll... Um, I'll hand it to Laura because she's got a better understanding of Perth which is 
the capital. I'm from a regional town. Um, and it's actually one of the challenges that we've got because at the moment the city council regulations for verge gardening, which is I think what you're talking about, um, they actually have quite strict rules of, you know, you can't connect canopy to understory, you can't connect canopy to canopy because of fire risk. Um, and that's actually kind of the opposite of what we need for biodiversity. So we're actually in the process of trying to have those conversations. Um, and, you know, the city of Albany is a partner on this project, so they're totally for it and they want, you know, to support biodiversity, but some of their policies aren't quite, aren't quite linking with that yet. And that's part of that conversation. Do you find that city councils are proactive as well? Like I know, I mean, I'm only from New Zealand, so, um, but I'm wondering whether they produce, we've got amazing pamphlets and stuff saying, okay, don't plant jasmine, plant this native equivalent. Don't plant this, plant this because of these reasons. You know, it's better, it suits this, our particular microclimate, our soils for the particular mm. area that you <coughs> live in. I, I, my experience of, of it is that um, it definitely depends on the local government. Yeah. So some okay. in Perth are very forward thinking, they encourage planting, yeah. you know, they, they engage and then others not so much. And my okay. local government is one that's not so much at the moment. And yeah, but I'll give you to Laura because she might know a bit more. Yeah, I guess just adding on to that, yeah, there is a lot of variation. So. Um, in Perth, there are a lot of local governments that are, are really forward-thinking and supportive, and um, and it's fantastic. On on the turning gardeners into conservationists project, as Bronte mentioned, we have a lot of uh, local councils that are partnering. Um, and then on the the Rewild Perth program that I mentioned as well, we partner with quite a few um, local governments to deliver workshops for people about wildlife-friendly gardening. Um, I guess one of the challenges is that each local government area has different policies around their verges um, and so uh, part of the thing that we're trying to understand is what are the different policies and how can we kind of make it a little bit easier for people that are residents to um, yeah, do the best thing that they can for their verges. Um, but yeah, a lot of the local governments do support by giving free plants and subsidies for the verge gardens. Um, and having amazing uh, like pamphlets as well, like um, City of uh, Fremantle does some great stuff as, as just one example, yeah. I've got a question for Bronte. Um, with your bird boxes that you put out, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I lost you. Um, do you line the walls, the interior walls, with anything to um, detract from attracting honeybees? Yeah, so it's something that we spent a lot of time, we reviewed a lot of structure designs before we recommended a particular one. So we actually worked with Simon Cherryman, who is sort of a holo expert, I guess, or a um, nest fox expert in southwestern Australia. And so the boxes, all of the boxes were designed to have an air slot at the top, just under the lid, which meant there's airflow, which tends to um, reduce the likelihood of honeybees um, using them because of the, the air. It, they don't like the, the flow of um, air. <laughs> um, and, and all of the nest boxes had a, a ladder so that any animal that used the box could get out. Um, so, you know, if you don't put a right ladder in, they can get caught at the bottom and, and die like the ecological trap, um, which both of these guys mentioned. Um, and the other thing is that we um, put some dry, usually chipping materials like wood chips in the bottom to encourage nesting, but definitely nothing damp and nothing like straw or, or anything wet that's going to create mould in the box. Got a question over here. Um, my question was originally for Bronte, but I think it sort of applies to all you women up there. Um, do you or have you considered working with um, building companies? Because I know that what you're doing is sort of responding to people who already have a backyard, um, but maybe being proactive and working with them to design houses in that way. Um, I know that you're, I'm going to say on the wrong side of the country, but <laughs> I, I work with local builders in Brisbane to do just that. And this is the sort of thing like, again, um, not duplication of effort. If I don't have to go and design gardens for these builders to then implement when in their construction, if that already exists, then I'd love to talk about, if you don't already, working with builders to um, enhance what you're doing. It's actually something we would really love to have a chat to you about. Um, so we, we have a, so no is the short answer, we haven't yet. And so we have a scientific steering committee that helps us with this project. Um, one of them being the Western Australian 
Biodiversity Science Institute and they have suggested the same thing and have offered to like connect us but we would yeah we're, we haven't yet taken that opportunity up and it's something that I think we feel would be a really good next step because like you say you tend to engage people that are probably already maybe dabbling um so to to be able to affect people or, or gardens that were never going to be wildlife friendly gardens would be the next key step so yeah I might come find you I think in the crowd on Do you want to add? okay yeah yeah, but that's a really good idea because, you know, it's much easier to plant a native bee garden than when there's already a garden there and take things out. You know, people get very attached to their flowers and they don't want to take them out. And, you know, garden only has so much room. And, yeah, I guess there's there's a lot of mis misinfa in the misinformation out there about what flowers are good for bees because it's all targeted honeybees which of course whole different you know different needs to our native bees and you know they are an introduced species that can harm our native bees like a big part of my research was looking at exactly what flowers our native bees like and lots of them are very specialized they're very fussy you know some will only forage on metaceae some will only forage on fabaceae so if we design from the start gardens that are attractive for native bees if we have you know trees there that are good for bees if we plant our verges um, with gardens you know verge gardening and trees that the native bees like so when I was doing some of my surveys some of the you know, best resources for our native bees were um, the Mary trees this is in WA cause I'm from the right side of the country <laughs> um, yeah so yeah those those native trees Rather than, you know, it's a bit too late when we have rows and rows of jacarandas, which, yeah, they look nice, but they really only attract honeybees. So working with um, building companies, I think, would be an amazing opportunity to, from the very outset, outset provide advice, you know, like known advice about how we can create these wildlife habitats. Because I think everyone wants to be able to interact with wildlife. This is like part of our nature. And so if we, we do that, it makes people happy overall. On the topic of uh, native bees, there's a great project called uh, Look Up Planting Seeds, the B&B &B Highway Project in, in Sydney, Judy Friedlander at U University of Technology. She's doing great stuff with schools and building, um, building pollinator gardens. And uh, on the topic of the right side of the country, can I say that, uh, you know, working in Verge Gardens for, for many years now, WA, a city of Vincent and a couple of the other um, councils down there have been leading the way and driving the change back east where you know you try and put something on the verge you, you drop a drop a flower on a verge in the Gold Coast and you'll have the police on you you know it's, it's unbelievable so there's a long way to go but WA is doing great stuff so I think we've got time for one more question fantastic group of uh, talks really inspiring and informative and positive so thank you to everyone um, and I want to talk to all of you for ages, but I particularly wanted to highlight and question about uh, to Bronte about the um, the monitoring. I mean, that just blew my mind that you've got people who've been monitoring every week. So, is that what you said since 2020? So I was just curious, a to check that that was really true because I think it's amazing. Um, but also, any insights you've got into how you did that? <laughs> Yeah, um, we were blown away too. We were aiming for 60 in two cities, so 60 in Albany, 60 in Perth, and we ended up with an initial response of 2,700, and we're like, hmm, we've got to upscale this and quickly. Um, the main technique we used was feedback. So, like, um, we don't just collect data and don't share the results. Every month we summarise our results, put an infographic up, email it to them, post on media thank them, tell them what they've achieved, this is what we've done. We take photos when we're at conferences and go, we've featured your photos. And so we send them every month updates about the project, which I think encourages prolonged participation. Um, <clears throat> we also were very, um, I guess, inclusive, that I would use. I would, um, so we didn't say you need to have at least three methods and you need to do it every single week for 12 months. We were like, anything you can do is amazing. Like if you can just, if you can only do one, choose one method. If you want to do 10, do all 10 methods. Like choose your adventure was kind of the style we took. And I think that really helped because it meant people felt like even if they missed a week here and there, that it was okay. And it kind of con got them contributing for longer, I think, because it gave them that, I guess, peace of mind that they weren't letting down the team or anything. 
Um, anything to add? Yeah, just to say that, um, yeah, we tried to make sure that it was, no matter the level of contribution you make, all of it is really valued. Um, so some people could only do a few surveys and then they had to stop because, you know, life got in the way. And we were like, well, thank you so much for your time and for your contribution. And yeah, so I think that sort of feedback um, was really valuable. And also just because people were enjoying it as well. And like we saw, especially like bird counts and bird bath surveys were probably the most popular monitoring method. And that's because people were just enjoying sitting there with their cup of tea and relaxing doing it. Um, and then for the other survey methods, it's because they're really excited about it. Like doing a spotlight survey, they were just excited to get out at nighttime and see what's in their garden um, and to contribute to, to the project. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, sorry. Oh, oh. Um, and, and the other thing I think that also helped was we staggered our in-person engagement. So we didn't just do a whole bunch of engagements at the front and then left them. We would have you know, in-person engagements and then three or six months later have another set and share results and have people in the room. And I think having that face-to-face -face contact you know, they develop a personal relationship with you and you know they get personal relationships with each other and that really helps um, along with we made it kind of our mission to always reply to people within 48 hours so like any questions or things you know I'd be checking my emails at night replying to emails to make sure that they were getting like you know conversation with people rather than just their data going off into the ethos and then never hearing about it Wow what a fantastic session um, and what an opportunity to have this impromptu panel. Uh, women in horticulture, women in agriculture, women in STEM right here. It's incredible to see just how much work is being done by incredible women. And uh, there you have it right here in front of us. Please thank Robin, Kit, Bronte and Laura.